This is our Pastor's Corner teaching series, and in this teaching series, we've been looking at the Old Testament and the books of the Minor Prophets to be specific. So if you're just tuning in now, we invite you to go back and look at the various other books we've already explored. Uh, but if you're joining us today, what we're doing is we're going to be looking at the book of Micah. So at this point, uh, we're going to examine the backdrop first and give us some context to this book and then look at chapters one and two. So at this point here, I'm going to invite you, if you want, pause it here and read chapters one and two of the book of Micah. All right, so let's begin. We're going to do some backdrop work here on this book and to look at some of the context here. So let's start off with Micah. Micah, his name means who is like Yahweh, who is like God. Um, and in fact, one of the funny things about this is that at the end of the book in chapter 7, verse 18, uh, it says this, Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives and the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? So if you read that, it's it's like this play. The, the person writing this book, the person who's the prophet here, Micah, his name is Who is Like God? And he almost ends the book with that question, Who is Like God? Micah here is a little unique. Um, one of the things that we have here about Micah is that he doesn't identify himself by his father or by his family name. Uh, he actually, ident actually identifies himself by location. He comes from a place called Morseth Gath, which is about 22 miles uh, southwest of Jerusalem. I don't know if that has any bearing on anything, but it is a little unusual for a prophet. He doesn't identify himself by a family name or by his father's name. He really so much identifies himself by where he's located. Um, so for Micah, he's actually a prophet who's going to be speaking God's word into the southern kingdom at this point, in the southern kingdom of Judah. So some historical backdrop again, um, the north and southern kingdom of Israel after Saul, after David, after Solomon, there was a split between the two kingdoms, 10 tribes to the north, two tribes to the south. Uh, the top 10 tribes became the northern kingdom with the capital city in Samaria. And the two southern uh, tribes became the southern kingdom with the capital city of Jerusalem. And they called themselves Judah. So Micah is preaching and prophesying at this time in the southern kingdom. At the same time in the north, you have Amos and Hosea, whom we've already looked at uh, in our previous videos. They're prophesying in the north and Micah's in the south. At the same time Micah's in the south, you have Isaiah also prophesying at this same time. So, and Isaiah is just considered a, a, a different prophet simply because of the volume of stuff that he has. So Micah and Isaiah are contemporaries, both preaching into the southern kingdom. So this book is written at around 735, 750 to 700 BC in that range, 750 to 700 BC. Uh, and the reason for that range is because we have here in the beginning of Micah, he, he's uh, saying these things during the reign of King Jotham, King Ahaz, and King Hezekiah. So you have this time frame that's been given to us. Uh, also then at this time, that means that the Northern Kingdom is under attack right now by the Assyrian Empire. And so this is kind of the backdrop of what's all going on. Because the north, the kingdom in the north and the kingdom of the south, they both have the same problem. They are violating the covenant of God. See, they were supposed to be God's people, God's representatives uh, to the nations around them. They were supposed to keep God number one in their lives, uh, but they've started worshiping other gods. They've compromised themselves. And as a result of them worshiping other gods, they've also compromised their ability to relate to one another. And so they're taking advantage of people. They're exploiting the poor. Um, they're hurting others and therefore God now is going to cast judgment on them and his judgment comes in the form of a nation that will take them over and into exile. So at this time right now, the northern kingdom is being attacked by Assyria and eventually Assyria will attack Jerusalem, the capital city, but they won't take everything at this point. And Micah's prophecy will, will give some indication of Assyria, but then after that, he's going to tell us about the Babylonian Empire, which will completely destroy the southern kingdom. And so uh, this is the backdrop of kind of the political situation going on in the world at that time. In this book as well, what we have are some uh, themes that we want to look at. There's two main themes that come out of this book. Uh, the first is the judgment of God. And the second is the forgiveness of God. And what's amazing is that these two things go together. Um, God cannot, in his justice and in his holiness, he cannot let sin go unpunished. So if there are consequences to Israel's sin. There's consequences to Judah's sin. And those consequences are going to play out in God's judgment by having these other nations come in and take them away. Take them, either destroy their cities or take them into exile. And then with that, at the same time, even though God's consequences for sin are there, 
That is not the end goal. The end goal is that God will ultimately bring forgiveness. God will call his people back together and he will forgive them and he will continue to be their God and they will continue to be his people. So that's uh, two main themes that we need to continue to keep in the back of our head as we look at this. So one of the ways that we're going to approach this book, we're going to approach it in three parts. Uh, so this video series will be in three parts for the book of Micah. The first part is to look at chapters one and two. Um, and then chapters three to five, and then chapter six and seven. Here's how we break it down. It's broken down simply because these are the ways in which Micah's message kind of flows. He says the word here. Every time he says the word here at the beginning there, it's actually a, a, a sentence, a section break for us. And so it's quite uh, broken down quite nicely for us. So chapters one and two will deal with the idea of the coming judgment and at the same time, the promise of being restored. The middle section will talk about the ac accusations of the people of Judah and then the future hope that they can have. And then the last section will talk about the final judgment of the people of Judah and the promise then of God's forgiveness. So each section starts with a message of despair, right? There's something bad. And at the same time, there's this tiny glimmer of hope at the end. And then here's the bad stuff. And then there's this glimmer of hope. And so that's how each section breaks down. So Micah is speaking on God's behalf. He's going to be taking some very harsh language to uh, the people of, of Israel. And, and the language is going to be challenging and it's very accusatory. But at the same time, Micah does so because he's been, uh, he understands his calling as a prophet. One of the key verses here is chapter 3, verse 8, which says this, But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might, to declare to Jacob his transgression to Israel his sin. And so Micah recognizes that these words of accusation and judgment, they're God's words given to him. He's been empowered by God's spirit to go and speak these messages. So the book has all these accusations and warnings, but then again, each section ends with a glimmer of hope uh, for us to consider. So let's look at section one. We're going to look at chapters one and two. So open your Bibles. We start off here in chapter one, and what we have again, like I said at the beginning, is an indication. This is Micah of Moresheth, and he's speaking during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. And his vision is for both Samaria and Jerusalem, so for the capital city in the north and the capital city in the south, but more so the entire book is going to be focused more on the southern kingdom. And he says to the people to hear, hear you peoples, all of you, listen, earth and all who live in it, that the sovereign Lord may bear witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. And so he's just calling people. This again, this is how he rallies uh, this vision. He calls people to hear. And then what we have here in verse three is this, look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. He comes down and treads on the heights of the earth. The mountains melt beneath them and the valleys split apart like wax before the fire, like water rushing down from a slope. This uh, image here is actually a play on a previous image of God coming to Israel uh, from Mount Sinai. Uh, during that time, though, God, that's when God made a covenant with Israel. God made a promise with Israel that he would be their God, they would be his people. For 500 years since that time, Israel has been living in rebellion to that covenant, to that promise. It's like they've been cheating on God all this time for 500 years, right? And so now God is coming down again, but this time it's not going to be to establish covenant. It's going to be to bring a judgment on Israel for violating that covenant. When we get to chapter 1, verse 8, what we have here is a funny play on words. This is a poetic book. It has some elements of poetry in it. And Micah is going to be using these names of these cities. Now, these cities geographically, there's not much in terms of understanding them. It's really for a poetic structure and for a fun play on words that Micah is going to use. I'm going to do my best to explain some of it uh, for you. In fact, I'll try my best to explain all the different cities. First is the city of Gath. He says, tell it not to Gath. Tell it not in Gath, weep not at all. And the idea is, tell it not to tell. And the idea of the word Gath is the word to tell. And so he's saying, don't tell the place that tells, right? And so it's the idea he's playing with these words. Beth el Afar is a place of dust. It's, the, it's playing on the word dust. And so um, in Beth Ofra, roll in the dust. So in the dust, roll in the dust. In Sapphire, um, it's a place of beauty. And yet for Sapphire, it's a, when people pass by, it's going to be a place of shame. They think it's a beautiful city, but it's going to be a place of shame. Um, to those who live in Za'anen, it's the idea of um, the word coming out. So the, the city where people come out, they're not going to come out. 
is what he's going to say there. In Beth Ezel is in the morn is in mourning. It is no longer there to protect you. Um, Beth Ezel is a house of leadership, of support, and it's the idea that Beth Ezel is a place of support, but it's not going to be there to support you. And those who live in Meroth uh, writhe in pain, waiting for relief because the disaster has come from the Lord, even to the gates of Jerusalem. And so Moroth is a place where it was supposed to be good, and yet what's going to come out of this is this pain and bitterness that's going to come out of it. Um, he says, you who live in Lachish, um, and Lachish was a place where you would get horses to, to hitch them to chariots and to go into battle. And he's saying, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to Lachish. Instead of hitching horses for battle, you're going to Lachish to get on your horse and run away. And so it's the idea of harness fast horses to chariots. Well, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to harness, the, get, grab the horses, and we're going to run for our lives. And then he talks about a place called... Um, more more Chef Gath, which is where he's from, and it's the idea of a place of betrothal. It's the idea of the wedding place, the where you give your wedding gifts, and so the dowry is given there. And so here's the image: is that okay? The husband is now giving the dowry here, and who's going to receive it? Well, the bride is going to be given away to the Assyrian Empire. And so the it's this play. Well, it's a place supposed to be celebrated because oh, this is where the bride's going to be, but she's going to be given away to the evil empire, and and you're not going to like that. And then you have the town of Akzib, which is the idea of being deceitful. The town of deceit will prove deceitful. And it's really funny to play on these words. And Merasha is a place where I will bring the conqueror against those who live in the place of conquering. Right? And then lastly, you have the nobles of Israel will flee to Adjulam. Now, Adjulam is, a, is an interesting place because this is the place that David ran to when he was running away from Saul, a place of refuge and of hiding. So you know what's going to happen? you're going to have to go run back to a place of refuge and hiding. So the judgment of God is coming. And you can read about that story in 1 Samuel 22 uh, about how King David had to run from Saul. So these are how those kind of towns play on these words. And, and to me, I, I just geek out about stuff like that. I just think it's really cool. We miss out on the English language sometimes when you get to study it in its original context and in its original words. Um, so I just thought that was something fun um, and to see how that played out. And we get into chapter 2, and chapter 2 gives us the reason why the judgment is coming on the nation of Israel here. And, and so for Judah and the people of Israel, the, the judgment is coming because of two things. The first is this, the leaders of, of Judah, the leaders here, you are becoming wealthy through theft and through greed. You are stealing and abusing people, and, and you're taking from the middle and the poor, uh, and, and you're you're doing it for yourself. And so here's what happens. In verse 2, it says this. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them. They defraud people of their homes and they rob them of their inheritance. Now, the idea of, of stealing land and property from the weak is a violation of the covenant. And the covenant that you can find, the Ten Commandments, found in Exodus 20, verse 17. The last one there says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's property. And so the people, the leaders here were stealing from others. And, and uh, even what happens here is there is a reference uh, to King Ahaz who stole Naboth's plant, uh, land. And it's, you can read about that story in 1 Kings chapter 21 and in 2 Kings 9. Uh, so Ahaz was a corrupt king. He, he stole from land from people. Again, a violation of covenant. So the rich in the land, the leaders of the land, were doing the same thing. They were mistreating the people and they were stealing and becoming wealthy through uh, means of corruption, through means of greed. And so that's one of the first indictments. The second indictment is this. It's about those who prophesy. And it's found in verse 6 onwards. It says, do not prophesy, the prophet said, do not prophesy about these things. Disgrace will not overtake us. You descendants of Jacob, should it be said, does, not, does the Lord become impatient? Does he do such things? Do not my words do good to the one whose ways are upright. And so what's happening here is that the prophets at that time were corrupt. And what they would do is that if you paid a prophet good money, they would pronounce blessing and they would pronounce promise on your life. Do you hear that? If you paid a prophet good money, they would pronounce blessing and they would pronounce good promise on your life. It's like what we call today a lot of the prosperity gospel. A lot of people who just say, you know what, God wants you to be healthy and wealthy. So uh, give us money, and I promise you, if you do these things, God will make sure you're healthy and wealthy. False prophets were here back in the time of Micah. False prophets were back in our Bible times. They continue 
on to today. People who just really just water down God's word. That's another example of a false prophet. Here's, the, here's what was happening. A lot of these prophets, they were willing to compromise everything for a buck. And they wanted to say nice things for people to hear so that people would like them and people would give them money. And that's the thing that still happens today. A lot of pastors are like that too. I'm a pastor, I know, and I see them. And you know what? God forbid I ever find myself in, in those kinds of shoes ever. I, this is, I'll tell you, let me be honest. This stuff drives me crazy. There are too many of us as Christians who just want to hear what we want to hear. And really what we call that, it's really false prophecy. It's, it's just not true to the word of God. It's not true to things. So a lot of times what we like is to hear, you know, placebo preaching is what I call it. Just give me, just give me a nice fluffy sermon about how to be good, how to live a good life. But the reality of the Christian life is that it's hard. It's challenging. It's difficult. The reality of the Christian life, it demands so much of us. It demands great obedience. It demands complete self-sacrifice. And yet many of us, we don't want to hear those messages. We don't like to hear the hard messages about go and do something to help the poor. We don't want to hear the hard messages of deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus. We just want to hear, oh, if you pray well, God will love you and bless you. That's what we want to hear. And that is an example of false prophecy. Then it continues to today. And so there's too many of us who want to just hear the good things. It's called an echo chamber. You just want to hear what you want to hear. And I'm going to challenge this notion today. And I always want to challenge you with this notion today. Please don't just hear what you want to hear. You really want to know who God is. Get in the word of God. Look at who he is. Because when you have a screwed up picture of God, you will not live the full life that God is giving you. You will not treat people right. You will have, you will be so self-centered. You'll be so selfish. You won't care about anything else. And here's the reality. I think a lot of us Christians, we have a false sense and a false understanding of who this God is and who this Jesus really is. Because this Jesus and this God, his kingdom is an amazing thing, but it's hard. It's hard and it's difficult and we don't like to hear it. But we need to wake up and we need to hear it because this is what true prophecy is like. People didn't want to hear Micah's tough words back then. They just wanted to hear, oh, just tell us that God will bless us. Tell us that God loves us. Yeah, but you're not following God. You're breaking the covenant of God. So wake up. He's telling them, wake up. And they don't want to. Many of us are like that today. Many of us are still like that today. I want to read to you these words uh, from a commentary. It says this, What these counterfeit religious leaders forgot was that God's covenants involve precepts as well as promises, obligations as well as blessing. Merely going through the motions of religion isn't the same as worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Anybody can join the crowd and be a part of some popular religious movement, but it takes devotion, prayer, obedience, and submission to worship God with reverence and godly fear. Popular religion is usually false religion, for the road to life is narrow and lonely, and those who walk in it are invariably persecuted. What I'm not saying is I'm saying is not obedience saves anyone, but what I am saying is that if you say you're saved, you will to some degree manifest a lifestyle of obedience. Not perfection, but direction. Obedience, their obedience to serving is their authentication of their faith. And I just like how he put it. The idea of the real way to follow Jesus, it's hard. But if we just want to have the fluffy, we're just following a false understanding, a false prophecy, a false religion, a false God. And so that's a real challenge that I want to put us put in front of us today. And then the last part of this in chapter 2 is verses 12 and 13. It says this, I will surely gather all of you, Jacob. I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel. I will bring them together like a sheep in a pen, like a flock in its pasture. The place will throng with people. The one who breaks open the way will go up before them. They will break through the gate and go out. Their king will pass through before them, the Lord at their head. And this image here is how God is though this judgment is going to come on Israel and though this judgment may even come on on people right like God is going to still be a shepherd king to these people he will bring people together as a shepherd to protect them 
and he will bring them together and be their king. And, and the idea of this idea, the king of God, the kingship of God and his kingdom is then that we are his subjects, right? We are his subjects. We are able to go and do his bidding. Uh, we acknowledge his authority. We acknowledge his rule and his reign. Uh, and so this image here is that God will bring them all back. Even though he's going to scatter them, he will bring them all back and he will watch over them like a king who is just and right and like a shepherd who loves his sheep. So that's chapter one and two of the book of Micah. Hope that's a challenge. Hope that's an encouragement. Love and peace. We'll see you again as we look through the next section next time. Bye.